for 70 degree weather. <laughs> Amen. I'll take that over 100 degree weather any day of the week. Amen. But uh, yeah, I'm just, I'm just so thankful for what God is doing, and I just want to um, uh, encourage everybody to continue to pray for them. And, and they've just been having a good time, it looks like. And I know uh, Darby and, and them were with them last week, and I know they enjoyed that travel, the trip with their kids, be able to spend time with them. It's always good to go on family vacations. Amen. Let your travel with my sister or my, my brother sometimes. <laughs> I love to death, but we have a good time. We're so close. We tease each other, and we have a great time. And I know that uh, Anthony's um, kids are that way, and the family just have a great time together and, and spending time together. Uh, and so we're going to break uh, the word open this morning. And uh, for those who are watching online, we want to welcome you. I didn't do that last week. And um, encourage you to, if you haven't watched the, the video, the video will be uh, posted. For those who maybe weren't here last week, will be posted uh, this evening. Luke is, was here I'm, I'm so thankful for the people that God has brought to the church to help out. Amen? Uh, Luke's family came in surprisingly today, and he has came in and made sure all the cameras were ready to go for today to record for next, for the, so we could post it next week. he have been spent time editing. And if you've never edited videos, Pastor Anthony can tell you, I can tell you, and Luke can tell you if you ask him, you can spend hours editing these videos. So these videos you guys see that are put out on, on Facebook and YouTube that we're, we're putting out there for people to watch, those take hours to put together. There's a lot of editing, there's a lot of cutting, there's a lot of sound stuff. So basically the software that we have on our computers is called DaVinci, and it's literally movie software that we use to create videos. And, and so Anthony and them guys are really good at it. Luke and them, um, I'm looking forward to seeing what he does with the videos, but him and Joy are are being a part of helping out. Did my battery die? We pause for a commercial break. So you have to, oh, forgive me. Is that better? Yeah. All right. So anyways, we're thankful for everyone. I'm so thankful for the worship team that's been doing an awesome job these last couple of weeks uh, leading worship and um, Dan for filling the drum for me so I don't have to, to worry about that and I can worry about just uh, preparing for the sermons that we're doing. But we're going to continue on today in our Go series. And today um, I want to share some, some stuff that um, has been on my heart. Pastor Anthony, I, talk, I, I, I told you guys this last week, we talk a lot. Um, through Messenger, or we'll go out to lunch and have so we like to sit down and just talk about things. And uh, they were at district council here a couple weeks ago, and he sent me. He was sending me because he knew I was be doing this series, and he was sending me text messages of all these quotes that he was hearing down there. And he said, "Hey, this sounds good. See what, see what you think about this. What do you think about this quote?" And so I was reading one of the quotes, and it really stood out to me. It really has become the basis of what this sermon is, because it was like, okay, God, God, always, his time is perfect. He knows what we need, when we need it. And when this came in, I'm like, this church and, and the, the whole church as, the, as a whole, the body of, of God, the body of Christ as a whole, need to hear this um, today. So hopefully uh, you all can share this and with those who come in contact. I hope it sets into you uh, this morning. So the statement that sparked the message today is this. It says, the church is that unique gospel community chartered by Jesus Christ himself. Consequently, it should especially labor to fulfill its unique mission to guard the gospel, proclaim the gospel, and disciple those who respond to repentance and faith to God. Today we're going to talk about these three points that are, that are brought up in this quote. And before we start digging into the words, um, I want to give you another quote that Pastor Anthony sent me while he was down there. Uh, because I think it's vital to what we're talking about today also. It says, um, the ability to impact a mission field is directly connected to the health of the church. If the church isn't healthy, it will be unable to have an impact on the world for the kingdom of God. While there are so many more things that uh, produce a healthy church, I believe what we are going to talk about today 
are the signs of a healthy church. These three things that he, he brings up in this quote are signs of a healthy church. And we're going we're gonna to break these down. We're going to bring the word in. Uh, we're not, I'm not, that's not my key verse, okay, for, for a quote. But it's, I think it's key to what we want to talk about today. And it's key for the church as a whole today. Because I see it in, in what's going on in the churches that are around us and, and what we're seeing in the American church, especially in today's times. Um, and I think it's a very vital thing uh, that we're going to talk about. Before we do that, let's pray before we start digging in. God, we just thank you. God, for your word, I just thank you for everyone that's here today. God, I pray, Lord, that this word will speak to our hearts. It will challenge us, God, that it will make us think, it will make us reflect on uh, our own personal lives and our own personal commitments and what we're doing, God. And Father, I just pray that you just go forth and just prepare uh, everyone to receive what you have for them, God, that we will think upon these things in the coming days and we'll reflect upon it, God. We'll, we'll talk to you about it, God. We'll, we'll, we'll just meditate upon it, God, and see, Lord, ask it to challenge us today. So God, I just pray that everyone, every heart and mind will be in one accord and receive what you have for them today. And let me pray. Amen. So the first point that is in that quote that he, he mentions is to guard the gospel. Guard the gospel. So if you have your, your Bibles, you can turn to 2 Timothy. Um, if you have the Bible app, it will be on there. Hopefully it loaded up. I get in the head nod, so it did. Um, and we're also going to be in, just for those of you who have your Bibles, want to put your fingers in at Mark 16, and of course, back into Matthew 28. So uh, those are some of our passage scriptures we'll be going to today. But starting in 2 Timothy uh, uh, chapter 1, verses 6 through 8, and then we're going to jump down to verses 13 through 14. So, starting at verse 6. For this reason I remind you to fan into the flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God gave us a spirit, not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but share in suffering for the gospel by the power of God. Now down to Verse 13, follow the pattern of the sound words that you have heard from me in faith and love that are in Christ Jesus by the Holy Spirit who dwells within us. Guard the good deposit entrusted to you. So the Bible speaks about the faith that was once all entrusted to the saints in Jude chapter 3, if you're writing notes. Um, the pattern of sound teaching in First Timothy or Second Timothy, verse uh, chapter one, verse thirteen, and the good deposit that was entrusted to you, Second Timothy, uh, chapter one, verse fourteen. All these are talking about um, what we would call the gospel. In other words, Paul is talking about when he's talking about here in Second Timothy, he's saying, Timothy, here's what you need to do. You need to guard the gospel. Keep it in front of you. Keep it at the center in the church. Preach it. Live it. Advance it. And if necessary, die for it. Let me read that again. Preach it. Live it. Advance it. And if necessary, die for it. This is the trust that he has, he has given to us. Listen. We have got to guard the gospel. In today's society, if you look out, the word is being twisted so much in our society. They are trying to make excuses uh, for their lifestyles because we don't like the word no, right? As, as you have a kid, what happens when you tell your kid no? They give you that disgusted look. Like, how dare you? Well, we have adults that act like kids when they're told no, they get disgusted and look at you and they get upset with you because they don't like the word no. Especially when you're trying to help them and, and lead them and guide them and say, listen, we don't want to go down this way, but we don't like the word no. So what we do instead, we make it fit what we want. And it's so prevalent in society. And if you don't believe me, just go on and watch the news. Go, go, even better, just go walk around your neighborhood. Take a trip to Walmart. I got, I got Jesse sees it all the time. He's like, preacher, brother. Get on Facebook. We have a problem in America with the twisting of the word. And I'm sorry to tell you, there are churches in America that are twisting the word of God to make it fit what they want it to say. 
Because we are all about appeasing people and, and making people feel good and comfortable about themselves instead of making them feel uncomfortable. Listen, God will make you feel uncomfortable. The Word will make you feel uncomfortable when you're not living the way you're supposed to do. It will convict you. That's what the Spirit is here to do. The Spirit is here to guide you and direct you and convict you in those times. It's not here to beat you up. Amen. It's not here to pick on you, but it's to help you become what you, you're to be. And as a church, we have got to guard the gospel and not be sugarcoating things and putting things out there. We need to be honest with what the Word says. Because why? Because I love that person enough that I want them to know that there's a Savior who came to this earth to die for them and cares enough for them that He wants them to know this is what we're supposed to do. It, it's about living for Him. It's about pursuing Him. It's not about making you feel good about yourself. Because let me tell you, if you want to feel good about yourself, just walk in His presence. He will be there. He will guide you. He will direct you. And you know what? You have joy. The, the Bible says the joy of the Lord is what? My? So if you want to be joyful, you want to have strength, just remember it comes from the Lord. So we don't need to sugarcoat things for people. You're not going to hear me come in and say, well, it's okay to do this. It's okay. To... No. If it's against God's words, y'all, we have to stand on God's word. We have to guard his word. We cannot let it infiltrate the church. It is slowly coming into the church where we're, we're saying it's okay to do this. It's okay to do that when it goes against God's word. And so we have to make a stand. We have to make a point that we are not going to allow God's gospel to change. We're going to keep it at the center of the church. This is what he says, and we're going to preach the gospel to people. We're going to live the gospel to people, because sometimes we like to talk, but our actions speak louder than words. And if you say, well, I got the joy of the Lord in my heart, and you look like Eeyore all the time, you're not going to, I'm sorry, you're not going to really portray that to someone, and they're going to say, well, I want to be like them. We have to live it. I, I strive and I hope we all strive that when I'm on my job, in my workplace, I'm the same person you see in front of you. When I talk to people and they ask me questions, I, I, I'm always there to try to, to, to give them, but I always let them open the door and walk through the door when it's open and make sure that I have something. The Bible says to be ready in season and out of season. So we have to always be ready at all times to live the gospel and to speak the gospel when, it's, when it comes time and when it's necessary. So he's telling us, the church, he's saying, church, guard the gospel. Don't let anything come in to the church that does not belong. Don't let the, this, this talk of, well, you can live this way because, what do they, people say? Because God is what? He is love. And he is a loving God. And thank the Lord, he is so loving. But he is a God of correction, too. He's loved us so much that he's, he's willing to let us go through and do what we want to do. But we make that choice to do it. There's eternity that waits for us. But it's our choice. But we have to guard the gospel. We cannot let anything come in. Those words still ring true today with what he was talking about there. A mission-minded church should guard the gospel. If we say we want to reach this community, we have to guard the gospel. The second thing... He talks about, and that quote was, proclaim the gospel. Mark chapter 16, verse 15 says, And he said to them, Go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to the whole creation. The ends of the earth, everyone needs to hear the gospel. The proclamation of the gospel is evangelism. We should be evangelizing as Christians. Everyone has been called to be an evangelist in one way or fashion. Did you know that? We all, all have been called to, if we are a disciple of Christ, we have all been called to be ministers of the gospel. We are to be evangelizing the gospel. We are supposed to be looking for opportunities to minister the gospel to those that are around us, to, to our co-workers, to our, our family members who aren't saved, to those people in the restaurants, the people in the grocery stores. We are called to evangelize. It simply means talking to people about Jesus and inviting them to receive him as the Lord and Savior. I know that's difficult for people because we're, we, we get really nervous when we, we go through and, and we have the opportunity to share the gospel with somebody because we, we feel like we don't have enough words or what to say to people, so we'll mess up. You can't mess up the gospel. Just give them Jesus. It's simple. It's simple as saying Jesus loves you so much. He came and he died on the cross for you. He went to the grave, but he rose victorious 
and brought us back in communion with the heaven, our, our Heavenly Father. And He loves you so much that He's here for you. And all you have to do is receive Him. Ask and receive. It's not a hard thing. It's not a difficult thing to do. You just need to ask Him and receive it from Him. Although this may be the easiest part, like I said, to understand, it's the most difficult because we, we don't want to look intolerant and we don't want to look super spiritual. The gospel is not intolerant. Giving the gospel to someone is not intolerant. And I've always found it's in the delivery. If I went to Dan and said, Dan, you're going to hell. You need to to ask for repentance. You need to repent of your sins. You're going to go to hell. How's he going to take that? Instead of going to Dan and saying, Dan, you know what? God loves you. I love you. And he has more for your life. Can 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 I talk to you about him a little bit? Can I share with you what he's done for me? Can I share what he wants to do for your life? And when that opportunity opens, he says, Dan, you want to give your life to the Lord today? You'll, you'll never be the same. See, the process, it's all in the delivery of how we say it to someone. And listen, I grew up in a hell, fire, and brimstone church. Old school, Pentecostal, jumping pews, running aisles. That's what I was raised in. And I heard that sermon about every Sunday. I'm thankful for my, my heritage. I'm, I'm thankful for that legacy because it taught me a lot. But I'm also thankful that I allowed the Holy Spirit and, and God to guide and direct me. And I got into my word and I studied. And God showed me the process of how we can really reach people in the kingdom today. Because honestly, y'all, what worked for our, our grandparents back in the day and my parents back in the day doesn't work today. Because you will shut people down so quick. So we have to go about a different way when we approach people because we are in a generation that people are touchy and people get upset over the littlest things. I was sharing with Sheena last night, we were at Walmart, and I looked over and I saw the package of Reese cups. Have you all heard about the Reese ordeal? So Reese's has this, this Reese cup and it has the gold medals because the Olympics is about ready to start. And if you look at the package, you see the chocolate. And it has like the design on it like a metal where it's like cut out and it's carved out. And you actually see the peanut butter coming through the chocolate. And if you remember like football season, the footballs, they, they, on the package, you see the chocolate football. Then it has like the lines in it like a football. And those are supposed to be the peanut butter. Well, if you open up the package, you know what you find? Just a chocolate covered piece of peanut butter. Like a Reese's cup shaped as a football. People got upset about that and sued because they were upset because there were no lines on the Reese cup like it showed on the picture on the wrapper. I'm like, it all goes to the same place, people. Just give me the peanut butter. That's all I care. You you don't get this by not eating Reese cups, okay? So, um, but we have a generation that is so touchy. We, you see on the news, people get upset over the smallest thing. They get offended over the smallest thing that when we were growing up, it's like, eh, oh, whatever. No, you're, we were all ducks that just rolled off our backs, right? But we are in a generation, so how we, how we approach people today is totally different. And so people, when you start talking, even the minute stuff, it, literally today, if you literally start talking about Jesus, people will get insulted. You can talk about anything else in the world, but if you talk about Jesus... People are getting insulted. It's happening more and more today. I see it a lot. We can talk about anything else. That's fine and dandy. With the whole Palestine thing going on, as long as you're on one side, you're good. If you're on the other side, you're bad. It's the same way with with Christians. If you're a Christian, now we're, we're starting to become the bad people. People don't like to hear what we have to say because we're called all these different things that we're not. We're here to give people love and give them grace. And so, and then we become super spiritual. Some people think, well, you just think you're holier than now. You know, I don't want to hear you because you just, you're just a perfect Christian, Tiffany. You just, you're just the most perfect Christian in the world. There's nobody better than you, right? I can never get there, right? I've, I've had these conversations. Some of you might have had these conversations with people. That they look at us that we're super spiritual because you're just trying to give them Jesus. We weren't saved to play it safe, y'all. We were not saved to play it safe. But the kingdom of God loses when we do play it safe. When God gives you the unction to say something to someone, 
and you let it go by, you're playing it safe. That's why I think it's important and vital, like it says, we're supposed to be ready in season, out of season. So when those things happen, you're ready to, to take that opportunity. When God opens the door, because, listen, I've been there, I've been guilty of it. When God's put on my heart to say something to someone, and I didn't say it, and then I felt terrible for the next week, because I, I, I kept coming back to my mind, you should have said something, you should have said something. So I always tried my best to make it a point. And do I fail? Yes, I fail. We all fail at times. I always try to make a point. If he puts it in my spirit to say something to someone, I find a way to say it. That doesn't come as a way that they're going to take it wrong, that they don't think I'm super spiritual, that I'm just a friend, just talking to them, that I care for them, which I do. And so we, we had to not be worried about playing it safe. The church has always uh, seen its greatest expansion when the work of spreading the gospel has been done by equipped amateurs, not learned professionals. See, some people think it's the pastor's job to do it. No. It's all of us, our jobs. You know, we, the, the statement, I, I, when I read it, I was like, man, do I really, would I really want to say that? Amateurs? The, the equipped body? What it's saying is you don't need a degree to spread the gospel. You don't need a degree to go and show someone love and show them compassion, to go deliver some car seats to some people because God put on your spirit to go deliver some car seats to people. Or somebody puts you on your spirit to go deliver some food. Or somebody walks up to you and, and they said they need, they need some food for the kids and you pull out your last $10 and you give it to them, not knowing and not expecting them to what they're going to do with the money. You're not sure what they're going to do with the money. But you're led to do it because you want to bless them. It's about being that, that person that God has called you to be, to be his hands and feet, to love him, and you don't have to have a degree to do it, y'all. He has called each and every person sitting in this pew. There is no excuse. Not one of us in this church cannot do what he's asking us to do. If he saved you, you should have a desire, a want to. It's not a have to, it should be a want to. I cannot ever repay him enough for what he's done in my life what he's done for my family, how he delivered my brother from leukemia, how he, he took care of my dad when he had throat cancer, how he's done so much, how he took care of our moms, she and I's moms when they had uh, heart attacks, how he continually takes care of us. He's always watching. I can never repay him enough for what he's done in my life. He has always been faithful. And when I have a faithful God or someone's faithful to me, I want to be faithful to them. I want to please them. I want them to look at me and say, good job, my son. Keep on going. That's what we want him to do. And I want him to do it in each of our lives. There's a reason that God has you here. There's a place that God has you at this moment that he wants you to do. A calling he has, no matter how big it is, no matter how small it is, it's to further his kingdom. And whatever fashion he puts on, so if he puts something in your spirit, let me tell you, the best thing to do, if he tells you to do something, do it. If you've never done it before, do it. And see what happens. See what happens. It's, it's a blessing. Listen, just smiling at someone makes a difference today. Because everyone walks around with no smiles on their face hardly at all. I make a point when I go through Walmart, if I make eye contact, if you make eye contact with me at Walmart, I'm going to smile at you. I might even say, Good afternoon. If it's in the if it's morning, good morning. How are you today? Make it a point, because you don't know what that person is going through, but a smile can make a difference. You might not think that, but it does. Because maybe they haven't seen anyone smiling all day. Maybe they're having a terrible time at home and they're they're being told they're not valuable. And you just smile at them, gives them some value, that you recognize them and you see them. Sometimes people just want to be seen. So be at that point where you want to be uh, part of the expansion. The third thing, disciple those who respond in repentance and faith to the gospel. Here we go again. Disciple making. Matthew 28 says, the first part of it, I'm going to do the first part. It says, go therefore and make disciples to all nations. He has called us to be disciples. I'm saying, I, I, I preach on you. are going to probably hear this all month long because it is vital to the kingdom that we are making disciples. They are, we are creating people. We are creating people and helping people, walking with people so that it can be reciprocated into someone else's life. That's what he has called the church to do. We are to evangelize. We are to make disciples. We are to be bringing people in. When Jesus said make disciples, we cannot help but remember how he did it. For three years, he walked a dirty, dusty road 
teaching these men, walking with them, living life together, setting, setting off the side of the road and, and you know, cooking fish over a campfire, talking uh, the word, breaking bread, sharing the word, just, just doing life together. I mean, we were just talking earlier um, about the Chosen series. And how many has, been, how many has watched uh, at least one episode of The Chosen? And I, what I like about that is it really, I think, depicts just life of the disciples and Jesus, how they just kind of, they were together. He was teaching them and, and doing all these things and discipling them, but they were also just hanging out together and doing life together. If you remember the day of Pentecost, what happened? You know, they said they, they were going to churches, they were in the houses, they were breaking bread, right? And they were eating, and then they would go out from there, and they would go into community, and, and the church was added to daily because they would go out and, and just share, but they were doing life together. They were hanging out. They were talking, sharing with one another. Disciple making then is the word of God shaping men and women within life on life relationships. And I enjoy hanging out with church folk. I like, I like going and talking the word um, and hanging out. We went out with Michelle and Ryan for some Italian a couple weeks ago and it was good, but it was just nice to sit around and talk to them. We go out sometimes on Sundays after church with Dan and others who want to go along with this and, and go have dinner. So if you ever want to go eat sometime, you know, this, over this next month or sometime we get back. I know the rest of this month is crazy for everyone with Father's Day and all that. But, um, you know, just go out with some of your brothers and sisters in Christ and just go have dinner with them. Plan an evening. You don't have to do that Sunday after church. Plan an evening. Go out and have dinner with them. Hang out with them. Just, just visit with them. Because it's about relationship. Deci part of discipling someone is about having a relationship with them. Like I talked about Casey and Sierra last week. We have a relationship with them. We've walked with them through things. We, we talk with them. It's a relational um, a type of uh, walk that we have as disciple makers. That it's, it's not just telling them what they're to do and not to do. It's actually living life with them. We, we had a, our, uh, our, our core young adult thing. And now we, we, we call it for our core group that we, we meet, you know, when we have our, our activities. It's about doing life together. Because we're all in this together. How many people really know the person sitting next to you, unless you're related to them, but if you're sitting next to someone, how well do you really know them? What do you know about them? How do I know how to pray for you if I don't know what's going on in your life, if I don't know anything about you? How do I know you need some assistance if I, if I don't know anything about you? And the only way to do that is if I spend time with you, encouraging. The Bible says we're supposed to, he said, we're supposed to come together, lifting one another up, encouraging one another up. You know, we're supposed to hold each other accountable. These are the types of things we are supposed to be doing as disciple makers. I'm gonna, there's two things I want to talk about with the church. Number one, a church that does not make disciples has lost its identity. Let me read that again. A church that does not make disciples has lost its identity. Discipleship is what has defined the church. That's what it's about. Jesus modeled discipleship as he walked with his disciples and taught them about the kingdom of God. And in Acts, if you go to Acts 11, 21 through 26, and, and write this on your notes, read later, it describes Paul and Barnabas following Jesus' example by making disciples in the early church. The church is defined by the Great Commission to make disciples. Making disciples is our identity. That's what we're here to do. We're here to reach the lost, preach the gospel. We're here to disciple people. So we're, we're, we're guarding the gospel, we're proclaiming the gospel, and we're discipling people. That's what the church is here for. It's not a social club. It's not to come and hang out and, and, and just do nothing. It's you know, sometimes we get, and I think uh, when Sunday evenings we get ritualistic, where we, we get so wrapped up, it's just like, well, I'm going to church, well, why are you going to church? Well, because it's Sunday. No, I'm going to church because I want to I go fellowship with my brothers and sisters in Christ. I want to grow in God. I want to see what God's going to challenge me with the word he's given the pastor uh, uh, today. And I really want, I'm looking forward to what he has. I'm ready to worship God. I mean, we're supposed to be worshiping God throughout the week, but this is the time that we come as corporate worship, as brothers and sisters in Christ, and we can come and we need stuff. We can come to the altar, and we know our brothers and sisters in Christ, are gonna, they're not going to judge us. They're going to come. They're going to love on us. They're going to pray with us, and they're going to be there for us. That's, that's what we're supposed to be doing as church. You know, and then from there, we take it outside the church, which we're going to talk about in a couple weeks. But inside the church, we are supposed to be making disciples, encouraging one another, lifting one another, doing life together. The second thing, a church that does not make disciples has missed the reason for which they exist. 
We have missed the reason. It is the business of the church, like I said, to make disciples. While some churches may be great at implementing many different programs, and there are some churches in here that have some really good programs and a lot of good uh, things for consumers. But people who just want to come consume, we have a lot of consumers in the church today. Amen? There are churches that people go to just to go to because it's easy to go to, and they're consuming what they have to offer. When we were pastoring in Huntington, I would get phone calls, and people would tell me this. They were asking, what does your church have to offer me? My response was, Jesus. Programs are great. Children's ministries are great. Youth are great. Senior meetings are great. Young adult meetings are great. They're great things to have because they're about also helping using the disciple. But I don't come to church for that. I come to church for Jesus. I come to, to worship him. I come to, to celebrate my brothers and sisters and encourage them and lift them up. Uh, and I hope that they, they do that when I'm in need. If they are not making disciples, they're missing the purpose. We are missing our purpose, y'all, if we are not making disciples. If we are not bothered by the fact that there are so many lost souls in this community that are not being reached for the gospel, we should be grieved in our spirits. We should be hurting for the lost. We should have a desire. There should be something burning within us to say, how can we get into the community? Because this is my question a lot. Being someone who's very you know, into outreach, and love helping people whenever we can and have the opportunities to do it. It's something that I'm always looking at. What can we do? I don't want to reinvent the wheel because there's other great ministries in this community. I don't want to do what they're doing. But God, what are we missing? Because there's a margin of people in this community, I guarantee, that are not being ministered to because there's nothing there for them to reach them. So what are we doing to that point? I'm getting my message in a couple weeks. But anyways, um, I want us to concentrate on what we are doing here at this church. We have ministries in this church, yes. We have great opportunities to disciple people through the women's ministries, through the men's uh, ministry, the, the, the youth. The kids. There's all these things that we can do, we can utilize for mentoring those that come in, those that come into the, the church doors, making them feel, number one, feel welcome and loved. I was really thrilled to see everyone greet the young man, Javier, right? See, he's been on my mind all week. Greet him last week and make him feel welcome. That's what we're supposed to do. Make them feel welcome when they come in the door and, and let them know that they're loved and they're, they're appreciated for, for being here. But it's our jobs to make disciples. We need to be growing as individuals. We should be seeking God's word. Like I said, I listen to podcasts throughout the week a lot. I'm always listening to different sermons. What are you doing throughout the week to grow yourself? Because discipleship is not just someone doing it all for you. It's you taking the time to do it. So what do you do through the week to grow yourself? What are you doing to advance yourself? I, I use this example a lot, and, it's a, and I'm sorry, I don't apologize for it because I think it's a very true fact. If you're doing the same thing you were doing five years ago in the church, you're dead. That's truth. That's truth. We should always be looking for new things that God's doing. I made my leadership when we were pastoring read a book called Who Moved My Cheese? If, you, if you've been in leadership or you've been in management somewhere, you might have been told to read this book. It's a business book, but it, I said this is, this is something that could correlate to the church in itself. So let me break down what Who Moved My Cheese is in here in just a, a couple minutes. Who Moved My Cheese is about two people, and the, guess what their names are? Him and Hall. And then two mice, their name is Scratch and Sniff. And they're running a maze. And as they're in the maze, they're, they're going to find the next load of cheese. So as they find the next load of the cheese, they, they find this big group of cheese, and they're all excited. The, the, uh, him and Hall, they're all excited, and they just start digging into the cheese. And Scratch and Sniff, they're excited they found the, the cheese, and they're eating the cheese. But the next day, while him and Hall are still eating the same cheese, uh, Sniff and Scratch are now out looking for the next pile of cheese. And what it says to us is we are always supposed to be looking at what God is going to do next or what he's wanting to do next. And we get stuck in a place that this is how he operates and this is only where he can operate. We are missing out on what God's wanting to do. We should always be looking ahead at what God can do and God will do if we're looking for it. Whenever people would come to our church and we would talk to them and people would look at them and they would say, but though this person was a drug addict or this or that, I said, something my dad always taught me and showed me was a comment he would make, I don't look at someone where they're at now, I look at where they can be. And if we have that mindset as a church and disciple making, don't look at the person where they're at now because people will frustrate you. Amen? 
People will frustrate you because you can pour into someone and pour into someone, and the next thing you know, they're, they're down another rabbit trail, and, and, and it just frustrates you. But you don't give up. You keep praying for them. You keep encouraging them. We are, we are, we are called to be disciple makers. We are always supposed to be looking at people in that way that God can do great and mighty things. God can take them to a whole other level. God can do things in their lives. So we have to pursue that, that fact that we are to be disciple makers. And that's my challenge for you guys today is, what are we doing? Our, our, our reflection point is, what part can I play um, in helping my church become a church on mission? What part do you play in that? I want you to think about it. We're going to start, start reflecting on the day. I'm going to have Ryan come and uh, get, ready, get ready to close here today because that's my challenge to you. I want you guys to really chew on this. This is, this is not like a... Uh, and Pastor Anthony, because Pastor Anthony can go deep, y'all. I mean, that's what I love about him. He goes deep. And I said, Pastor Anthony, I'm a, I'm a more topical kind of guy. You're an expository preacher where he can go really deep on things. And he does a great job at it. And I love listening to him preach. But I like to get to the point on some things. And this is my point. In it, it's that we are to guard the gospel. We are to proclaim the gospel. And we are to disciple those who come into the gospel. That's, our, that's what we're supposed to be doing. And, I, and that's my challenge for you today. Is, is that part of it, is we are to pursue him. This church, y'all, when she and I came to this church and we became part of this church, we, you know, we love the church, we love the people, the people are wonderful, they're awesome, and it's, it's great. And here's the, here's the thing that we see. When I look at this church, I see what this church can be and where it can go. And my prayer is the people will see that vision and see what, what's being cast out there, what Pastor Anthony brings stuff and, and shares stuff, that we see that vision and we grab a hold of that, but we're always looking to what we can do. Th this church can be an awesome pillar in this community. Why? Because we preach the word. We proclaim the gospel. We're about making disciples. And so we want, we want to see everyone in the church. My, my prayer is to see everyone grow. I, like, I love seeing people, when they get the aha moments, as a pastor, I just so awesome when I talk to young adults especially and, and you're ministering to them and you see them have that aha moment. It's, it's awesome. It is so awesome. And I want everyone to realize that you have a purpose and a place. God has a call on your life to do some awesome things for him. You just got to be willing to do it. You just got to be willing to say, yes, I'll, I'll do it. Some of you probably already know. Some of you probably already have a heart for, for things that maybe you want to do or you feel like God's leading you to do. You know what? Pursue it. If you need help, there's people here that walk with you and help you and guide you and direct you any way we can. But God has a call on us to do things. There are so many people, so many people. I work with people. I love them to death, but I know that they don't know Jesus. And any opportunity I get to share Jesus with them, I try. And there's good people, right? You all, we all know a lot of good people, but there's going to be a lot of good people in hell. So it's our job to get out there and give them Jesus. I wore my shirt today because you all know this shirt I preached last year about tearing the roof off. It's still my, it's still the thing I still push out there to people about getting people to Jesus. That's our job is get people to Jesus. And when we get in front of Jesus, then we got to walk with them. Because see, his friends, the, the, the cripple, his friends walked with him. They took him to Jesus. They walked with him. They got him closer to Jesus. They carried him. They walked with him. And I'm sure they had those conversations as they were going. But the main thing, they got him to Jesus. And then when they got to Jesus, his world changed. That's why I want us to know that when we disciple people, we, we, we give people the gospel, their lives are going to change. Changing ways. I know I look around, there's testimonies of people, what God's done in your life. You guys can each give your testimony of where you were and where God has brought you to. You know what? And if you want more of him, he'll give you more. It's, it's all what you want. It's what you desire from him. You know, if you're not here today, you don't know Jesus, I'm here to tell you he is the best thing that can happen in your life. He loves you. He cares for you. He came to this earth to die for you. He wants nothing more than to be your savior. And give, if you would just give your heart to him, your life to him. Is it easy? No. Life isn't easy anywhere. But it's so much better. You have someone you can always lean on. I could call him upon him on the midnight hour, and he's always there.